Good afternoon, nice to meet you everyone. So um, I'm Jeremy Esset from Chosun University in Guangzhou and today, today I will talk about the, uh, the case of mobile banking in Morocco. And the reason I'm doing this is because if you look at uh, hist throughout history, when you analyze crisis, crisis usually means more troubles to more people, right? And the question I'm asking is, is the COVID crisis a blessing in disguise? I'm not asking this question in a cynical way, meaning that it could benefit a minority of, of people, but actually I think it could truly benefit uh, Moroccans, a majority of Moroccans, from the perspective of financial inclusion as well as social inclusion. So that's why I'm going to talk about today. So um, the reason for doing this is if we try to define, of course, the corona era, we can define it by the way that we have uh, entered into the intact society, right? And before the corona era, we had uh, contactless transactions. So uh, I'm making the hypothesis that uh, those two uh, conditions can converge and um, the hypothesis is the following, uh, the COVID era uh, could be expected to uh, expand the use of mobile banking, uh, not only in sub-Saharan Africa, as is often talked about, but also in uh, North Africa and in Morocco. So uh, what I will talk about today is briefly go through a few definitions, then uh, explain why Morocco could be considered as an exception in Africa in terms of uh, mobile banking as well, and then I will focus specifically on Morocco's symptoms, that is how uh, Morocco has been impacted by the crisis, and uh, see what solutions Moroccans have uh, found to solve those problems. So basically, as you all know, probably the mobile banking is just a conversion of cash into electronic money, uh, and you do this by making deposits but it can also provide for online transfers, uh, payments, settling bills, or topic, topping up uh, phone credit. And in the case of the most advanced um, transactions, it also facilitates uh, tax payments, microfinance, microinsurance, and investments. So um, I based my uh, research on two uh, articles mainly that were published before the corona era, and one is by Berado, and he favored, I mean, Berado et al., a, a few scholars, they favor the technology acceptation model, TAM, which stipulates that basically people will adopt a new technology if it's useful and if it's easy to use. Uh, and their conclusion in 2013 was that uh, the Moroccan market is ready to welcome uh, such a service. But with the benefit of hin hindsight, we can see that this didn't happen actually in Morocco. So, it's easy to judge with a 10-year distance, but actually they were wrong. So we will try to explain why. And then HRB and Hassanuddin also um, uh, conducted a research on mobile banking. Um, their framework is a bit different. They're using the, um, uh, the theories of innovation diffusion, uh, IDT. Um, many of the criteria that they use, are, I'm not going to go through all of them, are very interesting and useful for my study as well, but their methodology seems wrong to me because um, the way they're conducting the investigation, uh, their target population, and I'm quoting here, is uh, Moroccan people that are bank customers. And one of the benefits of mobile banking is actually that you, you can reach out to people outside the uh, frame, framework of banks. You can reach out to unbanked people. So that seemed to me like going directly against the logic of mobile banking as we see today in 2021. Um, but those two studies are very good. It's just to pick a bit on them and see how we can improve them. So just to wrap up a little bit the implications of what I've been saying so far, banks are no longer, uh, no longer exert a monopoly on, uh, on payment services. Um, now mobile payments rely on three kind of actors. Banks, they didn't disappear. Telecommunication companies, the telcos, and also new companies that are very interesting because they're new actors um, um, who provide electronic finance services. Um, and then mobile banking, uh, when we think about mo mobile today in Korea, we think about smartphone, of course, but in Africa, many uh, people cannot afford the smartphone. They have first generation uh, mobiles and still through SMS, through messages, you can still transfer money. So um, um, it means there is a lower entry cost to mobile banking than to opening a bank account. So again, very interesting. So I'm, I'm going to try to illustrate the points I've made so far. Um, with a few maps and graphs. 
So this one is quite interesting. All, the, all around the world, you have 1.7 billion adults that are unbanked, that don't have a bank account. That's quite a lot. And the following one is my favorite one, because out of those unbanked people, two-thirds of them happen to have a mobile phone, which means you can reach out to those unbanked people through mobiles. And um, I'm, I'm not a geek. I don't like technologies that much. I'm not too much into finance either. But this is very interesting in terms of financial and social inclusion. You can reach out to more people. That's why I'm interested in, in that topic. So um, trying to do that research on Morocco is a bit hard, because sub-Saharan sub Africa is a very hot um, region in terms of mobile banking. Uh, so most of the, the articles just focus on uh, sub-Saharan Africa. And when they talk about Northern Africa or Morocco, um, as you can see here, they talk about MENA. What is MENA? Middle East and North Africa. So where is Morocco in this? How can you find uh, data about Morocco? In, in, in the French literature, it's the same. Maghreb and Moyen-Orient. So where is Morocco in this? So um, where does Morocco stand in the big picture? So. First thing I want to uh, say about this graph, uh, if you look at throughout the world, there are 10 countries with more people that have a mobile bank account than a normal uh, a mobile account than a uh, bank account. And those 10 countries are all in Africa. So that's very interesting. They're from sub-Saharan sub Africa. And then when we focus on um, Northern Africa, we can see Algeria here, uh, Morocco in the middle, uh, the number of uh, mobile bank accounts compared to normal traditional bank accounts is very low, and Tunisia is actually leading the sub-region in terms of uh, mobile banking. So where did Morocco stand before the pandemic? Well, 78% uh, of Morocco, Moroccans have a bank account, so that might be one of the reasons why uh, Moroccans are not adopting mobile uh, banking, just because they already have a normal bank account. Um, and about online services, only 2% of shops offered e-payments, 9% of Moroccans use them, uh, so very, very low rates. And um, contrary to world trends, bank counters are rising, they're on the rise, whereas as elsewhere in the world it's electronic uh, payments that are rising. So Morocco is, in that case, uh, we could say an exception in, theme of, in terms of mobile banking. So what was the impact of the pandemic? Well, I won't go into the details, but Basically, Morocco went through a lockdown, curfew, uh, health state emergency. Many people lost their job, like in many places in the, in the world. But on the bright side, online sales went up by 32%, and internet consumption went up as well, which means, which means Moroccans seem more ready to enter the contactless uh, era we are in. So what were the solutions uh, from the Moroccan uh, government first? Well, they thought about incentives, and the first incentive they uh, said is like, if you adopt mobile banking as a business, you will get 25% tax e exemption for, and now it's under discussion for the fast, first five fiscal years. So that's quite a big incentive. 25% of the money you make through mobile banking, no tax for five years. Um, then. Um, all the private companies are talking about the lowering or absence of commissions. Uh, and the, the head of the central bank, uh, Abdelatif Drali, uh, wants to give bonuses even to small local shops to push them to adopt mobile banking. So of course the benefit from the uh, government perspective would be that uh, there would be a transition from the informal economy to the formal economy. Second solution um, is not about innovating. Is a, a Morocco uh, thought in, Americans thought in very pra pragmatic way. They thought, well, what kind of programs do we have now? What are the uh, programs that are uh, reaching out to most people? How could we conduct those programs, not by giving cash, but by giving money through mobile banking uh, mechanisms? And one of them is a Tessier education program, which provides a scholarship for uh, 800,000 children, so you can reach many households if you uh, tell people, we give you the money provided you have a mobile banking application, so that was a, quite a smart way. Then um, um, mobile subsidies will be then delivered uh, from the uh, school start of 2022, and it, uh, so next year, and uh, first it will be tested in four regions, so first Meknes, Benguenil and Azilan. And the benefit is, as I said, uh, you are linking 
uh, financial inclusion with uh, trying to connect the urban and rural areas and reaching out to unbanked and people that are dropping out of school. So uh, it's not just financial, it's also very, uh, pretty much a social issue. And then if we have a brief, uh, brief uh, look at uh, the operators uh, offering mobile payment solutions in Morocco, we have banks, they didn't disappear. We have phone companies, only three phone, uh, big uh, phone companies in Morocco, Inouï, Maroc Telecom and Orange Maroc. And then uh, maybe the second category here is the most interesting, registered payment institutions, because those are, those are the new actors. And we, um, what is at stake here is can they compete with uh, state-owned companies and with central banks? So that will be uh, one of the issues in the coming months. Uh, if we take the example of Buried uh, Bank Mobile, well, uh, compared to 2019, their uh, mobile uh, transaction rose by 79%, so that's, that's quite a good figure here. And out of all their transactions, 24% are made now through mobile banking. So there's been some progress, and the reason for this is that uh, since 2018, so the reason why Moroccans could act, adapt so quickly is before the pandemic, the law was already passed to validate the M wallet, mobile banking wallet. So uh, this framework is legal and sustainable. Sustainable, why? Because if you don't have the right regulations, then uh, your, your economic um, paradigm cannot be sustainable, and they have the right laws. Now there are 1.5 million M wallets in use in Morocco, and mobile retail payments only increased by 1% in two, uh, 2020. So you would think that's not much, but actually you have to remember, you have to dispel the myth that uh, e-services and mobile banking services are disconnected from the real uh, material exchanges. Actually, they're not, because if you look at uh, um, worldwide, uh, there is a shortfall of 13% uh, benefits uh, in terms of mobile banking. So the fact that Morocco can still progress is, is pretty good. So now uh, we enter the discussion part of the presentation and uh, those solutions uh, are the one I suggest. If Moroccans want to go deeper into that uh, mobile uh, banking uh, pattern, then they should uh, extend the mobile banking be mechanism, for instance, to the Talamon program. Uh, maybe as well all the companies uh, that have been impacted by the crisis and that get some subventions, uh, the Moroccan government could say yes you can get the subvention provided you accept my uh, mobile phone application. And then um, maybe I can connect here that last point with a presentation of uh, Professor Hong before. Uh, one of her students was saying that um, very often development aid is di disconnected from our culture and one of the points of Ben Saud and other scholars is that if you want mobile banking to uh, succeed in Morocco, you have to connect it with uh, cultural practices that are deeply entrenched into the Moroccan culture and this could be um, 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 the savings, uh, the credit books in local stores and other kind of, other kind of donations. Um, I will finish by talking about three binding constraints. So what are binding constraints? Uh, we can talk about an exhaustive list of obstacles to adopting mobile banking, but binding constraints are the main obstacles. And the, the idea behind this is from Hosman, he's a Harvard paper scholar, he, he, he published a paper about this, and he said basically, you don't have to tackle all the, all the problems you have on your list, you have to tackle the main one, and then the secondary problems will solve by themselves. So um, the first binding constraint in the case of Morocco Thank you, yeah, five minutes, perfect. Is cash. Uh, uh, like in many countries, Moroccans have a partiality for cash, so the, the, that's a measure by, we, by which to gauge the informal sector. Uh, if you just look at the combined effects of Ramadan and the Talamon operation, uh, cash circulation uh, increased by 20%, uh, cash withdrawals, and that led to uh, liquidity issues with, uh, on average, during the second quarter, of 2020, 94 billion of dirhams uh, in liquidity. So that was a big issue for the government. Then the second issue would be the lack of trust. Um, like in many countries, um, you have the, uh, the Moroccans launched the application uh, we can now just to trace COVID cases, right? And many citizens um, felt a bit reluctant to use it because of the 
um, the record of their government in ma mismanaging or managing cyber data and uh, security. That's what sc some scholars argue. What I would argue is that in, uh, in Morocco, as in many uh, developed countries, the de debate is open on what are going to be the commercial uses of um, uh, mobile data or the political use of mobile data. I come from France, and French people really strongly re rejected uh, the applications. And here in Korea, we can see that uh, we can trace very uh, easily with great results uh, COVID cases. So uh, that's not uh, specifically Moroccan issues. It happens in many developed countries as well. And then. Um, the uh, most concerning point, maybe the last one, bank banking data uh, has not been included in the definition of personal da data. So whether this is intentional from the government or whether this is because there's just a loophole in the law because, of course, mobile banking and internet banking is relatively new, well, we don't know. Uh, only time will tell us. And then I will finish the last slide of my presentation. Uh, with a more open question, we might wonder what um, banking uh, mod model, mobile banking model Morocco wants to adopt. So on the one hand, you have the Chinese model. Uh, um, uh, Chinese go through third-party payment services like Alipay and WeChat, as we all know. And I would guess that this is not going to happen in, Mar in Morocco since I said earlier that only 2% of uh, shops have uh, e-payment solutions. So. It's not, the time is not ripe yet. I mean, not in the midterm at least. Then we have the very well known Kenyan model in terms of mobile banking with uh, M-Pesa, uh, where they're going through um, um, uh, mobile net network operators. Uh, so that could happen and that would seem attractive in Morocco because you only have three operators, uh, Orange, Inui, and uh, uh, Maroc Telecom. But at the same time, you have to uh, think about the fact that this model is based, is 100% based, dependent on transactions, and the total amount of transactions is going down because of the economic crisis we're going through, and also commissions are going down because people are trying, to, the private companies are trying to attract more customers. So if you don't have commissions, less transactions, and that's the only way you can make business and benefits it's going to be hard for the new actors, I think, in Morocco to, uh, to make benefits and then to survive. So what would be the Moroccan model? Maybe centralized mobile banking, because uh, I said earlier that um, um, Abdelatif Djouali, the head of the central bank, is personally very much involved into pushing and even maybe imposing um, a mobile application of Al Maghrib, the main bank, to 400,000 uh, local shops that would reach 6 million uh, customers quite just automatically. Uh, a short bibliography, and we can have question and answers later. Thank you very much.